Hello. We want to welcome you back to another edition of Quest for Truth. Your hosts, Douglas Hamp and Rob Skiba. We are excited to come back. It's always fun, Rob. This is uh, becoming a tradition, and we're going to jump right in and just start looking at some scriptures. You know, we thought we would start by looking at Revelation chapter 1 and kind of work our way through. I mean, you know, Rob and I love the entire Bible. There's so much in it, but it's... uh, I guess, you know, prophecy is probably one of our favorite places to hang out. So the book of Revelation is, you know, it's an it's an amazing book, wouldn't you say, Rob? Because, you know, if you don't understand the Hebrew scriptures, then you miss so much. Have you, have you noticed that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm excited about diving into Revelation, starting with chapter 1, because as we go through it, we're going to find ourselves weaving through the whole Bible, really. I mean, you can't not do that to understand Revelation. Has it been your experience that... Uh, as you've you know listen to pastors and read books that people have a tendency to spend most of their time in the book of Revelation and the New Testament, but they often neglect going back and cross referencing or looking at what is the context of what John was seeing in relation to the Hebrew scriptures absolutely uh, you know I grew up i've mentioned it before in a Baptist church and uh, and very much in that kind of environment, and we used to say we're a New Testament bible believing Christian. Um, I don't so much believe that so much anymore. I, I yeah, certainly believe in the New Testament, but now I rather say that I'm a full testament believer in Yeshua. Uh, it's it's one big story from Genesis to Revelation, and if you just start with Matthew, I mean that's like starting at three quarters of the way through the most amazing mystery novel of all time, and you know you're jumping in three quarters of the way through the you know towards the end of the of the book, you have no clue who the main characters are what their motivation is, why they're doing what they're doing. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. Um, but that's the way many, many people are, I think. They just they spend most of their time in the New Testament, and nothing wrong with that. The New Testament is great, but if you really want to understand the context of the New Testament, I like the way you put it one time. The New Testament is like the commentary on the Old Testament <laughs> and the fulfillment of it. Um, so you yeah. got to look at the whole thing. Exactly. I mean, hopefully that should be obvious, but many times it's not. I mean, people have this bias, I find, against the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, and they say, well, you know, to start with the New Testament and then work our way back, maybe. And, uh, you know, we should... In fact, I had a, a discussion with a guy one time. I was talking about uh, a passage in Matthew. It just happens to be on the uh, the rapture of the elect, uh, the gathering of the elect there in Matthew 24. And I said, well, look, it's talking about the Jews, because if you go back to Isaiah chapter 11, there it says that he will gather his elect, Jacob, from the four corners of the earth. Mm -hmm. And this man, who is a a notable Bible teacher, he said, oh, you know, how can you do that? I would never do that. I'd never go back to the the Hebrew scriptures to look at uh, something from the New Testament. I'm like, Really? That's that's kind of crazy. You know, I was really shocked. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we we believe in taking the whole thing. I mean, I'm I'm so glad that we agree. I think that's why we can have a a decent show, even if we don't agree on everything else. But mm-hmm. you know, the the foundation of of where we're starting is the same place. And uh, and again, we're we're on a quest for truth. That's our so. Well, all right, we're gonna jump in here to Revelation chapter one, and uh, you said that you suggested that we start at verse seven. So well, we can go ahead and start right from the beginning. But okay. verse seven yeah. has always actually intrigued me. But there, I mean, this is not a very long chapter. This is what twenty yeah. verses in the chapter, but it's it's an interesting chapter. <laughs> Amen. Well, you know, I think the first thing to get by the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus, uh, this is the word apocalypsis. Apocalypsis uh, is a veil, and apo is from or to undo essentially. So this is the unveiling. Of the Lord Jesus, uh, this is the this is the ultimate disclosure, if you will. I mean, this is it right here. You know, I mean, when we talk about disclosure, we should start having a disclosure for Jesus. You know that, because uh, the worlds keep you know they keep asking, when will there be a disclosure for the aliens? When right. will they reveal themselves? You know, there is going to be a disclosure for the Lord Jesus, and I'll tell you what, when He does it, every person is going to see Him, and there's going to be no more. Uh, atheists on the planet because they're all going to realize, uh oh, we're in big trouble. When the when the veil between heaven and earth comes down, then Jesus Christ is revealed and he's coming back in flaming fire 
to take vengeance on those who have rejected the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What an incredible day that's going to be. Fantastic. I love the way you just put that. We need a full disclosure on, on Jesus. Uh, we've got all this alien disclosure, and everybody's talking about that. But, yeah, that's that's Revelation. That's the purpose of Revelation, the full disclosure of Jesus. I like that. That's good. <laughs> I know. And so, then you think we should start a website or something, you know, Jesus uh -oh. disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, just what I need, another project. Right? Exactly. Yeah, really. <laughs> okay, so we get the opening sequence there where he talks about, you know, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and then, we have the address to the seven churches, and I I believe that these were seven physical churches in in Turkey and Asia. Yeah, um, I do too. I do too. But and we're going to get into that in chapter two, uh, whenever we get to chapter two. Uh, but I I sometimes wonder if these, because a lot of people say these are types of of church ages, different types mm. of ages of the church. I I used to be in that camp, I, I guess you could say. Um, I think these were addressed to actual physical churches at the time of, of John. Um, but I've begun to wonder if these may not may, maybe apply nowadays to different yes. types of, of believers. Yeah, so I, you know, I totally agree with that. I totally agree that, uh, you know, this whole notion that these are representative of, of ages in, throughout church history, uh, I think it's extremely subjective to say that because who's to say when one starts and the other begins and right. you know really what you see is that these are types of believers or congregations uh, that are true throughout church history you know it, you can be you can become any one of these uh, you know if you want to or if you're not careful you can uh, drift or or become any one of these different kinds of churches and so or like you said as a believer as well it's not just a group thing but I think it's both so yeah, I, I really, uh, like you, I used to believe that this was talking about the different ages. You know, but then you start reading some of these guys. I know that Arnold Fruchtenbaum is, is fairly big on that. But, you know, who's to say when the Church of Philadelphia is going to start? And, of course, we always want to put ourselves in as a Church of Philadelphia, right? Because, right. you know, well, we are the good church, you know. And, and I, I just, I mean, I'd like to think that I'm the good church, but, my goodness, maybe I'm... Maybe I'm the Church of Smyrna, you know, or maybe I'm maybe I'm Ephesus. Maybe you know that's pretty decent. But then again, maybe I'm not. Like I'm, I've, maybe I'm the Church of Pergamos or something, or something. You know, I mean, it, it's so it's so subjective to say. Well, this this era in church history was typified by this kind of action because you know even at the at what's let's call it the height of the Roman Catholic uh, Church, you had the uh, there there were believers true believers in the Lord Jesus and um, you know you had the Anabaptists you had the uh, Waldenses uh, or Waldenses excuse me and there's another group I'm trying to think of uh, I can't think of their name at the moment but uh, you know these were all people that were believing the truth of the Bible so they were you know clearly uh, I suppose the Philadelphian kind of church or something like that and they were being incredibly persecuted. So, like you said, I, I agree with you that these are really something that are true of any age, of any particular group. It just, it's just saying, you know, this is, these are mirrors. It's like saying, here, hmm. look at this mirror. What do you see? Is that you? Well, kind of, but not really. Until you find the one that's a perfect match, and you're like, oh my goodness, uh, yeah, that's that's actually kind of me. I, I think I better, I better change. I'm actually the the church at. Thyatira, you know, I gotta yeah. do some serious repenting, you know. <laughs> sure. Now, of course, we're looking at that as 21st century believers, but if we go into the context of what John was actually writing, he was he was writing to physical churches that existed in his day. Oh, I totally agree. I'm not I'm not I'm not downplaying that at all. And what I'm agreeing with you, at least I think I am, is no, that yeah, what was I'm what was true. Sure clear. Yeah. No, what was true of those churches is also true of us today. Yeah, that's so right. So I, I right. totally agree. There were there were real churches in that age. And, you know, the other thing when we come to the book of Revelation, you, you, you really have to uh, start with a Jewish perspective. Hmm. And I, I think so often we have made this very much a Gentile-centric um, book, uh, the New Testament as a whole. And, you know, I, I believe we should not be doing that. It's Peter says that he writes to the elect that are in the diaspora, and 
he's, he's writing to Jews. And uh, James says it extremely clearly in his letter. He says, uh, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, there in the Greek it says, ente diaspora. It's the same term that uh, Peter uses. And the people that are in the That's diaspora right. are not Christians, uh, at least not Gentile Christians. They are Jews. Now, certainly... Well, they're, they're Israel. <laughs> oh. I want, I want to... Oh, okay. I've got to keep it. I've, I've got to keep it clear in my own head, just, Fair just for my own sake, because uh, yeah. we're talking about. He wants to reunite the whole family of of Jacob. Okay. Israel is twelve tribes, Jew being one from Judah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Paul and and you know, people say that Peter went to Rome and maybe he did, but you know, when you look at Peter's epistles, it says he's in Babylon. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I know. He's, he's out trying to reach the the ones in the diaspora, which. I would say we're never really lost because it seems like I mean Josephus knows where they were, John knew where they were, Peter knew where they were. Yeah. They they were known. It was known where many of these tribes were at at within the first century anyway. Well, look, I mean Babylon as a city was no longer, you know, really an operation, but the the outskirts of Babylon were still uh, existent. And you had Jews that never left the area till about 300 A.D., all right? And this is where we get the Babylonian Talmud, because it was right. from Babylon, okay? Uh, in fact, ding, ding, I have ding. a... Yeah, exactly. I, I, have a, I had a professor, uh, Professor Gaffney, in Israel, and uh, he's you know probably one of the foremost experts on the Second Temple period, and he's written a paper discussing how there were Jews in Babylon. I mean, what a what a novel concept, right? Uh, Paul says that that he him he, he Paul was the Jew or excuse me was the um, evangelist to the circum to the uncircumcision, and Peter was the preacher or evangelist apostle to the circumcision. So if you know you're Peter, you're looking for Jewish people or Israel, as you put it. Um, you know, fair enough. Um, you know, if you're not going to go to the capital, which is Israel, if you're not going to go to the second largest capital, which was Alexandria, you'd go to the third largest capital of the Jewish people, which was in Babylon. And it's so funny because, you know, you hear these commentators that say, well, you know, when Peter said Babylon in his epistle, he said Babylon because it was a code word, you know, like he didn't want people to really know. <laughs> But goodness, you know, what does Paul say to the believers in Rome? You know, I'm like, no, wait a second. If if Peter was saying Babylon instead of saying Rome, why did Paul come right out and say Rome? Why didn't he say Babylon, right? But you know, it's just right. one of those those silly kind of things that somehow it's crept into our tradition, and you know, it's really time that we stop believing that because it's just not true. Amen. I'm with you a hundred percent on that one for sure. Yeah. And, you know. Okay. So as we move forward in there, uh, where it says in um, verse six, and he has made us to be a kingdom of priests. Um, we we see that we are made as kings and priests actually. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, interesting. Uh, kingdom kings and priests uh, to his God and Father. Well. Um, you know, I was just looking at a verse in Isaiah 66, 21, and it says, And I will also take some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. Kind of interesting. I'll go back one verse here. It says, Then they shall pull all your brethren for they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all nations, on horses and in chariots and in litters, on mules, and on camels to my holy mountain, says the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord, and I will also take some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. So, you know, I'm always going to start with the Jew first and then include the Gentile. You know, I've been grafted in, you know, you and I, as believers in Jesus, we have been grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel, and it, it's such yes. an important thing because if if we if we ignore that we say oh we've replaced Israel or you know Israel needs a whoever is of Israel or a Jew needs to eat a ham and cheese sandwich and come join us that 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 <laughs> attitude is so awful you know it's like you know you know well we have Jesus we have the truth and okay Jesus is the truth but still uh, it, it's it's just 
completely, it's a replacement theology. Maybe it's a soft replacement theology, but it's still a replacement yes. theology nevertheless. And so we've been grafted in. That's really the point here is that we've been grafted in. So when I come to the book of Revelation, I say, okay, it's first and foremost a Jewish book, and I need to interpret it as such, and then move out from there. Yeah, amen. I agree with that 100%, because if, if we realize that we have been grafted into the cultivated olive tree that is Israel, and we are adopted into that family. I mean, Romans 11 makes it clear that's what we're grafted into, and Galatians 3 makes it clear that we are adopted into that family uh, and now heirs to the blessings of Abraham. But I would say also, you know, if, if we are adopted into that family, like when I married my wife, Sheila, she had a 13-year-old son, and I adopted him into my family. He had a different last name. Now he has my last name, which means when I die... He has he's he's an heir to whatever my family has to leave for him. He he is welcome to participate in every single tradition that my family has ever um, done. You know, as long as there's been skibas on the planet. <laughs> you know, um, now he can choose to continue to live with the other name if he wants to. You know, act like that other family if he wants to. Do the traditions of that other family if he wants to. But really, he is heir to to the blessings of my family now. And and I look at it the same way with regard to us as believers in, in Christ, as believers in Yeshua. We've been adopted into a family. What family? Well, Israel. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there are promises to Israel. There are curses to Israel. There are lots of things that are given in the Bible for us, especially if you take the whole thing into consideration, Old Testament, mm -hmm. what we call the Old Yeah, I don't even like saying Old Testament. Because I know, I know. Words mean things. You know, you say old, it's yeah. like, oh, that old thing, you know, we don't, we don't yeah. need that. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that, you know. But yeah, well, let's call it the Hebrew the lingo. scriptures. You know, I mean, okay, it would be nice right, if we could retrain scriptures. everybody on the planet to call it the Hebrew scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if we look at the Hebrew scriptures, you know, and realize that as people who have been adopted into this family, this stuff applies to us, and this is not replacement. I'm not replacing anybody. I've been I've been adopted into. I've mm -hmm. been grafted into. So you're right. We need to look at all of this stuff, especially if we're going to look at the last days, prophetically speaking. We need to understand who we are, first of all, to see what applies and what does not apply. And it's my belief now that I understand that I've been adopted and grafted into that family that is Israel. That's where I need to be looking. I need to be looking and understanding what's going on in the full testament from Hebrew to Greek scriptures uh, with this family that is called Israel. And um, that's going to relate to me. And when I think of king priests, uh, you know, the priests in, in the Hebrew scriptures were of the Levitical line. They, they were of the tribe of Levi. But we, through Yeshua, we, we are now made king priests in the order of Melchizedek. It's a different order. Uh, it's a superior order, actually. Uh, Melchizedek, uh, king of righteousness. We are king priests in that order. At least that's the way I understand it. Melchizedek, yes. Yes, uh... The king of righteousness, it's, it's a very cool thing. You know, um, well said, uh, first of all, but, um, well, I guess there's no, I'm not going to say but. Uh, I'm trying to think of really something really clever to say, and I actually have nothing to say at the moment. <laughs> so I'll hand the mic back to you. <laughs> well, okay. Well, let's go, let's move forward then. Uh, so we're king priests. What's interesting about the king priest idea is with regard to some of the things we talked about with, uh, in relation to the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at most people think, and we talked about in our first two shows, the, the two witnesses that, as the law and the prophets. But yeah. if, it, if, and I'm just going to say if, because we're still on a quest for truth. It's not the corner on truth, as we said last week. Yes. Um, if it's true that Zechariah 3 through 5 is telling us, because it uses the same exact verbiage that we saw in Revelation, that it's Yeshua, not Yeshua as in our Savior, but the priest uh, at that time, Yeshua, a, a man, another guy, um, and Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel's of the line of Judah, so he's he's in the kingly line, if you will. He's in he's in the branch that that produces the king. So you kind of got the king priests represented there uh, by Zerubbabel and Yesh Yeshua of uh, Zechariah three through five. Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting is. Um, in Exodus 19.6, it says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy yeah. nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Then if we go back to Peter, 1 Peter 2.5, it 
He says, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, again, it's underscoring this, this reality that Peter is speaking to Israel, or to Jewish people. And, um, you know, what's interesting is that they, re they actually refused to be a kingdom of priests. You know, when, what God was offering them was so much bigger than what they accepted. Yes. He's like, you, you all can be a kingdom of priests. And, of course, we know how it turned out. They're like, well, we just don't really want to do that. Why don't you go, Moses, and intercede on our behalf? So eventually Aaron got the job of being the high priest as it were. You know, when you, when you look back through the Torah, you, you see this digression of the relationship between God and Israel. God has really high expectations. He has great expectations, shall we say, of what this is going to be. You know, it's almost like God's like, hey, come on. You know, I'm so excited. I got so many things to show you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. You know, it's like kind of taking your kid to the amusement park. Man, we're going to hit all the rides. We're going to do all this stuff. But after a while, your kid's kind of, you know, dragging his heels. Oh, Dad, I don't want to go and do that. I just want to sit here, you know. And you're like, oh, man, I was going to do all the rides with you, but you just want to just sit here and just eat a corn dog, you know. And it's it's like, you know, God's like, man, I'm going to make you guys a kingdom of priests, right? But then what happens? You know, God God's on top of the mountain, so is Moses. And it's like really a funny interchange. God's like, uh, Moses, you know, those people that you brought out of Egypt, they're down there sinning. And Moses is like, oh, no, <laughs> don't you try that with me. No, no, they're the people that you brought out of Egypt, okay? God's like, uh, okay, you know. He's like, you know, um, <clears throat> those people that you brought out of Egypt, if you don't do something, I'm going to go kill them. He's like, no, wait a second, don't try that again. You brought them out, Lord, so just, you know. It's like it's really funny. You know, you've got this exchange going on. And God's like almost trying to hand it over to Moses, and Moses is like, no, you're not going to get away with that one, <laughs> you know. But anyway, after that, this, yeah, yeah. God's like, okay, he's God's like, I'm going outside the camp for a while. I'm ticked, all right. You know, I was going to do this amazing stuff for you, and you didn't want it, so now I'm going to leave for a while. Then you have this incredible verse in Numbers chapter 11. I mean, this thing is, is blows your mind. I mean, here, the children of Israel, they're complaining, okay? They're like, you know, what did you do? Bring us out here to kill us, right? And, you know, and other complaining. So this says, now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So where is God? God is in the midst of this camp, right? I mean, when, when they started out, God was in the center of this, and all the tents were around the was around the camp, the tent of meeting, where God was. His his Shekinah, his Shekinah, was in the middle of this. His presence was right there. He's like, man, I can hardly wait to hang out with you guys. And, you know, they're over two time and doing their other things. So now, at this point, they're complaining. And it says, so the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Tavera because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. All right? So, I mean, it's like here, you know, God is this, um, he's this fiery lightning kind of God, and his fire just starts to go out and to burn people up, you know? And you're like, oh, my goodness, this relationship that God wanted to have with the people because of their complaining and their griping and because of their infidelity that they did right away, God's like, man, i got to move away from you guys. It's not that I don't like you. Well, I don't like you at the moment, but I still love you. But, um, you know, that kind of pollution doesn't allow God to be next to him. He's like, I'm going to move away for your protection because if I don't, this whole fire coming out of me thing, that's going to go on and I'll consume the whole bunch of you. So I have to move away. So really what was happening is God was offering them to become a kingdom of priests, a kingdom, notice, a kingdom of priests, right? And they essentially said, we don't want it, give the job to Aaron and his brother, and uh, we'll just take the scraps, that's fine. 
I know. It's, it's actually heartbreaking when you realize what's going on there. Uh, kingdom of priests, they would be the priests, but he would be the king. It was a marriage. I mean, God was proposing. God was, he was marrying. I mean, everybody thinks the church began. We talked about this last week at, at Pentecost. Well, yes, it's true, but not Acts chapter 2 Pentecost. Pentecost, the first one, is Mount Sinai. That's when, that's when the marriage proposal took place. That's when everything, he married Israel right there. The, the, the law, as we call it, the Torah, is a marriage covenant. And and, the, and he uses marriage terms. You will be my people, and I will be your God. I mean, that's those are marriage words. Um, but yeah, like you said, you know, you use the analogy of the the amusement park, and it was, you know, you got this great thing planned out, but the kids like, yeah, you know, and that I'm not really interested. You know, it's actually heartbreaking when you realize that if you read the Torah as, as a marriage proposal, as a love story, because that's really what it is, and that's illustrated later in Hosea, where God's like, yeah, you know what? Let, let, I'll tell you what. You want to know what it's like for me? Why don't you go marry a prostitute, okay? And um, get back to me. We'll have a little dialogue. <laughs> you know, you can you, you get to see what it's like, what I feel like. You know, uh, it's actually pretty heartbreaking when you when you read it that well, way. Well, I think I think part of the problem is we've made God this stiff guy that doesn't have any emotions because he's God. You know, I mean, who? How could he possibly be affected? How could his heart be broken? And yet. His heart is broken so many times, and we see it in Genesis chapter 6, where it grieved the Lord. We see it in Ezekiel chapter 6, where it, it says that my heart is broken on account of your adultery. My heart is broken. I mean, imagine that. God's heart is broken. I mean, you're like, no, that can't happen because God is, is not like that. I remember I was teaching a class one time, and I was talking about God being a man of war, and one of my students rebuked me. No, he says, no, that's not true. That's, that's not how God is. I'm like, well, that's what it says in the Bible. And he says, well, that's just not true. I'm like, well, what am I to do about it? You know, I mean, that's what it says. It says that he's a man of war. I mean, don't get mad at me. I'm just reading what the text says, right? So if the text says that God is heartbroken, then God is heartbroken, right? And, and yet we've made God into this very stiff kind of guy. He's untouchable. He is, you know, without too many emotions. He's just in it for the glory. You know, he's just in it for the glory. I mean, I believe this comes out of the, the Calvinist tradition where you've made God into this really stiff, boring kind of guy, and he's just like, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. Why did I do it for my own glory? You're like, what kind of God is that? I, I don't even recognize yeah. that God, you know? And uh, <laughs> it, that kind of stuff permeates into our theology until by the time we get to Revelation, we're like, well, I don't know what it means. It's all symbolic. Let's just forget it. You know, it's it's just to encourage us to live a good life. You know, and it's like, no, you guys, this is a literal book. Yeah, there's some symbols, but he gives you the keys. Okay, he he shows you how to interpret these things. And if you don't find them in the book itself, then go back to the Hebrew Scriptures and you'll find the key. But but people are, very often are not willing to do that, so they're just like, well, then I just don't understand it, and neither can you. And it's like, well, no, you actually can. Well, yeah, I mean, we look in Genesis where he creates man in his own image, but we forget we're also created in his likeness. So not only do we have a physical body that is similar in appearance to him, but we we have emotions, we have the, the characteristics that we have in our life are in his likeness. So, yeah, we experience anger, we experience jealousy, we experience sadness, we experience joy, uh, happiness, uh, jealousy, all these things. And, well, what do you know? Scripture tells us over and over and over again that God has those same emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, let's take an animal. Let's take a cat, for example. When a cat has a baby cat, a little kitten, uh, well, the cat, the little kitten looks like the mother, and it even acts like the mother. You know, I mean, it does cat kind of things, right? And so here God has sons, right? I mean, he, we're called sons of God. Uh, certainly in the New Testament, we're called sons of God. That's because we look like our dad. You know, our body, as you said, it's very similar. To, I mean, it's, it's identical, really. It's not, well, it's not identical in, in all the attributes that he has, but we have a head, shoulders, knees, and toes, right? All those different things. Uh, you know, those are true of God. And yet, you know, of course, I wrote about this in Corrupting the Image. And I tell you what, when I was writing that chapter about the image of God, I was doing it with fear and trepidation. Because I uh, grew up on the tradition that God has no body. There's, mm -hmm. you, know, you, can't, you know, you can't really look at God because he's spirit. 
And so don't even try. And when you come to these descriptions of what God looks like, well, that's anthropomorphic language. And I remember hearing that for the first time. I'm like, oh, my goodness, that's a big word. I don't know what it means, you know. <laughs> so it, it must be true, you know, because this is a smart guy that's telling me it's anthropomorphic language, right? And I think we do that. You know, we have a tendency uh, to, to learn a word like, well, that's anthropomorphic language. And suddenly nobody knows what, it's, what they're really talking about. And when we come to these places where it says that he has hands, so he's got feet, he's got a head, he's got hair, we say, well, that's, that doesn't really mean that because we know that it's anthropomorphic language. You're like, well, where does it say that? I mean, where does it say that God doesn't really look like that? <laughs> you know? And, and that's the kind of thing that happens. And all this comes into our Bible study. And again, we come to the book of Revelation, for example, or any book, and we say, well, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that, and it doesn't actually mean that either. Uh, I mean, look, one of the most incredible passages is in Exodus 24.9. And it says, uh, then Moses went up, also Aaron, Adaph, Abihu, and Abihu, and the seven elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity, and they saw under his, uh, and it says, and, and the nobles of the children of Israel, uh, he did not lay his hand on, so they saw God, and they ate, and they drank. Okay, and you're like, well, mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems like they saw God. You know, I don't have to say about it. And they saw his feet, right? So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that I kept just discovering as I was writing the book, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, look at that. This is so incredible. And yet we have said, no, that's figurative. It's allegorical. It's hyperbole. We can't understand that. You know, I think as we get, really get into the book of Revelation, we have to talk about interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. And we've got to talk about hermeneutics. Like, how do you interpret the Bible? Because that is going to cloud everything that we do and also what everybody else is going to do or, you know, whatever tradition that people are coming from. So, I don't know, what do you want to give us sort of your take on how to interpret the Bible? Uh, well, we've talked about it before. I just I prefer to take it literally, <laughs> yeah. Whenever possible. I mean, yes, the Bible does use hyperbole. It uses symbolism. You know, it speaks in allegorical terms and parables, but it tells you when it's doing so. And so, when except for those times where it tells me to take it otherwise, I'm going to take it literally, and um, and I'm going to take it as a whole. I, I don't. I I think God is the greatest storyteller ever <laughs> and you know we believe that the scriptures were divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by men so it's really God telling it's his story you know history it's his story he's telling the story and and I don't think he leaves any plot uh, undone you know there's no dangling plot threads or anything like that it, it all comes full circle and I think that's why we see a lot of things repetitive in the Bible there's a lot of repeats you know and that which has been will be again you know uh, so that's that's the way I approach it Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that, and I'm using that principle in writing my latest book, Twilight of Eternity, uh, talking about the millennium and all the details that are going to happen, uh, writing it as a story, and it, it's exciting to see you know, how it does come full circle. It really is just an incredible story, and um, so, again, I've been using that principle to draw out some things when it's you know, sometimes it's not specifically stated a, a thing here or there, and so I use that principle to do my best to fill in the gaps. But, uh, all right, Revelation 1, 7. Behold, yeah. he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. I love it. It's great. It's like, oh, yeah, this is really cool. So uh, what does this mean, Rob? What does it mean? Tell yeah, me. well, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to presume that I know <laughs> exactly what it means. It's one. It's always been one of those, you know, intriguing pieces of scripture right there. You know, he comes in the cloud. Everybody's going to see him. Okay, but they also which pierced him. It, that one phrase right there. They also which pierced them. Now. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I've heard plenty of theologians talk about that's the Jews. Well, the Jews pierced them, you know. Well, actually, the Romans were the ones that nailed them. So is it talking about the Romans? Is it talking about the Jews? Who's it talking about? Mm. Um, and that's actually a prophetic scripture. Uh, and I'm going to go back here to Zechariah chapter 10, uh, excuse me, 12, chapter yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. So, you know, and this is in the last day's context here, right there, and it's talking about the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So Mm -hmm. I could see where that's where people would certainly say it's the Jews, the people in Jerusalem shall see him and, and mourn. And, of course, we have John chapter... 19, yeah, I'll make sure that's right. John 19. 37, right. Well, 37, yeah. Um, But let's back up to verse 32. Um, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that it he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. It's really interesting to me because, okay, John's the one testifying here. He, he was... Well, really, the only disciple that was there, you know, he had other followers there, Mary, and, of course, his mother was there. Um, but we see in verse 32 that it's the soldiers. The soldiers are there. They're going to bust the legs of the, the thieves, and they come to Jesus. He's already dead, and the centurion looks at him, and, and he pierces his side. And it's in that context where he says this is a fulfillment of Scripture, that they shall look on uh, him whom they have pierced. Well, who... Who physically pierced him? Hmm. Jews? Well, they were instrumental in getting him pierced, but no, they were, they were not the ones that physically pierced him. It was the Romans that physically pierced him. Hmm. Um, so, you know, taking this literally, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, conflicted in my thoughts on this. Uh, and then if you really want to go down a rabbit trail, and this is... <laughs> pretty wild actually we like rabbit trails rabbit trails okay are we're going to we're going to we're going <laughs> to bunny jump down some rabbit trails then because uh it's interesting i i um i actually started doing passion plays uh writing and directing them and playing the part of jesus in passion plays back in 1994 and it actually came as a result of i was on tour with alvin and the chipmunks this guy, i've had a weird life man <laughs> I, I guess. I was, yeah, I was in I the won't army. I against you, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. I was in the army for eight years, and I got out of that and went into a, almost a year worth of para, paramilitary operations. And then they wanted to send me to Panama. And it was one of these deals where if you get sick, hurt, or killed, nobody knows you you exist, kind of thing. You know, and I'm like, mm. I was like 23 years old or something. I'm thinking I'm a little too young for nobody to know that I exist. So I got out of that, and the next opportunity that presented itself, because I've always wanted to make movies and be in the film industry, was uh, an acting job uh, touring all over the country, and it just so happened to be with Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> so I was I was David Seville, you know, yeah, Alvin! <laughs> that was me. I, I toured all over the country uh, for about a year. Well, uh, we were in a show in, um, I think it was in Pennsylvania, uh, it's pretty cool because we were doing fairs and stuff, so we're hanging out with like the Beach Boys and stuff, you know, uh, doing the fair circuit. But I'm, I was sitting in a in a pool with the um, stage manager, and his name was uh, well, his stage name was Ox. That's, we'll just call him Ox. Ox said to me because uh, I was telling him what I was thinking about doing. I'm, I was like, I'm going to write this passion play, but I want to write it from the perspective of the centurion. You know, there's always passion plays. Every church is doing passion plays every year. Um, but, you know, they're always pretty straightforward, you know, the biblical narrative, the way it is. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's the Bible. But I've always been intrigued by these kind of oleo characters, the, the side characters, you know, that were present. You don't know a lot about them, but I thought, you know, what if I told the story of the Passion from the perspective of the centurion who pierced Christ's side? So that was that was my premise. And so Ox turns to me and says, well, do you know who the centurion is? I said, well, no, the Bible doesn't mentioned him by name. He says, no, the Bible doesn't, but the apocryphal texts do. So really, yeah, he says in the uh, Acts of Pontius Pilate or the, the um, I think it's the Gospel of Nicodemus, names him Longinus. And so he starts telling me about the, the uh, story of Cassius Longinus, the, uh, the centurion who pierced Christ's side. And according to the story, uh, he had poor eyesight 
and when he pierced Christ's side, the blood and water splashed into his eyes, and uh, he, he, it cleared his vision. He was able to see uh, miraculously. That's what prompted him to say, truly, this man was the Son of God, according to the, to the narrative. Well, so I start doing some research there, and you can, people can look up Longinus, and there's a, just a ton of stuff on this guy. Of course, you get into that, you end up in the Spear of Destiny world and all kinds of stuff. But what's crazy about the Spear of Destiny or the Lance of Longinus is that Hitler was obsessed with the thing, um, mm -hmm. and a number of other people were. Well, according to the to the legend, um, history says that he supposedly, because of the miracle of his eyes being cleared, um, it, it, he he converted to Christianity and became a devout follower. Some say he even helped the the disciples to protect their writings, uh, you know, and help them, you know, do his best to get away from the Romans, you know. Um, and then uh, he was became a preacher of righteousness also, and they told the, the Romans caught up with him and told him to, to stop, or they cut his tongue out. He wouldn't stop preaching, so they cut his tongue out. He was still apparently able to preach, so they cut his head off. Now, that's where history ends. But a lot of legend, goes, just a ton of legend, uh, you can find about the immortal soldier. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a whole series of novels called Casca that was written by a Vietnam veteran, Green Beret. It was all about uh, Casca, the immortal soldier. Uh, over, In fact, the TV series and the movie Highlander was actually based on that legend, uh, on Longinus. And he pops up in pop culture all over the place, as does another guy, Cartaphilus. Uh, he was the main bad guy in the movie The Seventh Sign with Demi Moore. He, that's another legend. He was supposedly the guy that actually physically nailed Yeshua to the cross. And then there's another one. If and, and again, we're rabbit trailing here, but <laughs> this is uh, and I'm going somewhere with all this. Believe me, um, this is the uh, legend of the wandering Jew, uh, Ahasuerus. Another story that Hitler was also rather obsessed about, uh, and you can read about Cartaphilus in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, then there's this guy. Count Germain, who actually is linked to both Cartaphilus and Ahasuerus, his legend seems to blend with these guys. But this guy, and I'm talking history now, the other stuff is kind of fairy tale, legend kind of stuff, but this is history. There's a lot of writing about this guy in history, of this supposed guy that's been around for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, that popped up uh, in and out of royalty. Uh, you know, he would, people would see this guy at parties or whatever, and then 50 years later they'd see him again, and he didn't age a bit, but it's crazy. So what was interesting to me about all these re weird stories is each of these individuals in legend and, and in fact, history, in one way or another, pierced Christ. Uh, the wandering Jew was said to have uh, been a merchant where Jesus was carrying his cross. He fell in front of the store, this guy's storefront or whatever, and he pressed the crown of thorns in front of his head. He said, get out of here before you bring down destruction on all of us. And according to the legend, Yeshua said, where I go, I'm going willingly, but you shall wander until I return. And that's where the, the, uh, the legend of the wandering Jews got started. And when Casca appears to side, he supposedly saw the spirit of Christ above, above his body, and he said, a soldier, you are content to be a soldier, you shall remain until I return. And the legend of the immortal soldier starts. And so you got all these crazy historical accounts of these people who are said to have pierced Christ's side, and then you've got what we just looked at in Scripture, they who pierced him. Uh, the context there seems to be the soldiers. So, you know, I don't know what to think of. I'm just I'm giving all this stuff. I'm a researcher. This is evidence. <laughs> this is things that I found. It makes for great science fiction. <laughs> but Yes, it does. Wh what do we do with it? Because it's saying <laughs> that they who pierced him, and there's no indication of an, an elaboration as in symbolic, allegorical, figurative parable or what have you in Revelation 1 7 it's it, yeah. it's if I take it literally it says they who pierced him will see him when he comes back okay um, yeah <laughs> no that's it's interesting stuff I mean it's it's fascinating I, I liked Highlander that was a great uh, great series of movies but based um, on some measure of legend apparently well, you know, it's it's fascinating. I mean, you know, I, that's what I like about Jesus. You bring up some stuff that I never would have thought of. Um, I, I don't know that I agree with that, but uh, I mean, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna hold to the Zechariah twelve ten passage. Uh, and in fact, but that was you know, fulfilled in John nineteen, though. Well, I I do see that. Yeah, I see that. But I don't think that that is. Uh, I don't suppose that is eclipsing. Um, 
you know, I mean, it's one thing, you know, if you say, uh, you know, who who was responsible for the execution of somebody, you don't say it was the executioner. I mean, okay, yeah, he pulled the hatchet, but, you know, it, that's just a job, you know, that's not the authority and the one who's really causing the execution to take place. Uh, that's just a guy who has a job, and his job is to chop people's heads off. It's not a very nice job, but it pays the bills. But, you know, I mean, if he didn't do it, then somebody else would do it, right? You know, it's different than the person that is actually pressing to have this done. So, you know, and in a look, and it's not only, I mean, I w here's what I would say. Jesus said to the the leadership of Israel, you will not see my face again until you say, Baruch HaShem Adonai, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it says in Hosea, he says that I will depart again, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense. And then in chapter 6 it says, after two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up. So mm -hmm. going back to, to Zechariah 12, and if we look at uh, the International Standard Version, it, uh, and the Hebrew for that matter, uh, it, it gives, uh, instead of look upon me, it says they will look to me, the one whom they pierce. In fact, the word in Hebrew is not the word al, which would be on, but it's actually the word el, which means to or toward. They will look to me, the one whom they pierce. That is, it's not that they're going to see him. I mean, you know, they ultimately will see him, but they're going to look to him when you, like a child looks to his father for guidance, okay? Yeah, okay, he's looking at you with his eyes, but he's saying, please help me. So what's going to happen here? Why are they crying? I mean, he's pouring out this, this uh, spirit of, of grace and supplication, and they're going to mourn for him as an only son. Imagine if you were to lose your only son. Think about that as a parent, how you would cry, and you would cry, and then you would cry some more. Right? So they are going to finally realize that the one that they rejected is the one, the only one, that can actually save them. So, you know, here they're actually crying, and I believe they're going to cry for two whole days, which is not very much if you're weeping for an only child. I mean, you would cry for a whole lot longer. In Israel, you, you cry for what's called a shiva, which is a seven. You cry for seven days. You mourn uh, for the death of a, of a loved one. So, you know, these guys are finally realizing what has happened, and they're, they're looking to him, bec uh, not upon him, but they're looking to him, something that they were not willing to do. And this is specifically not exclusively, but it, it is specifically looking at the leadership of Jerusalem. They are the ones who who were really put Jesus on the cross. It wasn't the masses that put Jesus on the cross. It wasn't the Jewish people as a whole that put Jesus on the cross. It was the leadership that were afraid of what Jesus represented. They were afraid of losing losing their power. They were afraid of what would become of themselves if they accepted him. And so when Jesus says, you will not see my face again until you say, Baruch HaBab blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so finally, after all this time, after the time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to finally say, okay, we were wrong. We were wrong. He is the king. He's the only one for us. He's the Messiah of Israel. We are going to call upon him now. And once they make that realization, they're going to cry their ha their hearts out for about two days at least. Okay, and, so uh, I mean that's 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 if I was to be asked directly, what do I believe? That would be this my answer as well. I mean that's that's it seems to be the the less fantastic and uh, <laughs> you know and probably the most biblically supported. It, it just seems so weird though that you know because you're talking about the leadership. You're right. It's not the people in general. It was the leadership, you know, the Sanhedrin, the high priests, all that, that they were the ones that, that had him pierce. Um, and the one, one of the reasons why I brought this up is because somebody on my Facebook asked me also where, where it says in uh, John, when uh, in the end of the Gospel of John, when uh, 
Jesus basically tells Peter how he's going to die. He says, "Well, what about what about him? You know, what, what about John? He's like, what's it to you? You know, if I say he's going to be here uh, until I come back, you know." Uh, and then there's the other passage where Jesus says, "You know, there are some here that I, that will will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in great glory." You know, and all that. So they're asking me, what, "What do I think of that?" And I said, "Well, I, I, you know, I believe John was among the people that was there when Jesus said that, and he indeed saw." The revelation. So he saw him coming in great glory, and and Peter and Jude both had some kind of vision of the end as well because they wrote about it, uh, and so did Paul. So you know that would be the simplest answer I would give to to that. That's not so fantastic. It's just mm. it is interesting. I mean, and they also which pierced him will see him. So you know, I don't know. It's interesting to me. So basically, you've had people that are supernaturally living since the time of Jesus, and they're going to see him when he comes back. Uh, I get it. You know, I mean, I guess the the trouble well, is, I don't. You know, how I'm can just, you prove I'm, it? I'm not. Know, uh, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not saying that's my theory. I'm just pointing out the evidence, uh, especially if you look at. I mean, Saint Germain, Count Germain, turned into Saint Germain, and he's interesting now because he's one of the ascended masters of the occult. Right now, um, he's he's one of those that the New Age are all looking towards. They they all love Saint Germain, um, but he started out as Count Germain, and and I mean people could do their own research, look into the history of Count Germain and this guy uh, that was said to be the immortal alchemist that he just never ages, um, and he shows up all through the 1500s, 1600s, into the 1700s. Some say he was even present at the uh, signing of the Declaration of Independence, and, and this is not just like fancy storytelling. This is historical documented accounts. So it makes you wonder. I mean, I'm look, it's evidence that I'm just putting out there on the table that's out there uh, that other people have believed and wrote about for centuries. So, you know, I don't know what to think about it. I, well, I appreciate that. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's exciting stuff to consider, and uh, I think the world is probably a lot uh, stranger than we can ever imagine. Well, but, truly, uh, I mean, think about the crazy stuff we already believe. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. I mean, like like L.A. Marzulli starts off some of his talks by saying, okay, guys, we believe in people that walked on water, that multiplied fish, that, like, lived in the belly of a fish. You know, uh, you know he goes through all, you know, the axe heads can float. Um, you know, there's already a lot of stuff that w if we take the Bible literally, we say we believe, so... Yeah. You know, you know. <laughs> well, uh, back but here in nothing in, else. It just makes for great science fiction. As as a writer, <laughs> I think man, these are some cool stuff to play around with. Uh, uh, no, I, to I think about. I totally agree. Looking again at uh, verse seven, it says he's coming in the clouds. Now, um, you know, I, I've I've given some thought to this uh, idea of clouds. First, I just thought you know there's going to be some just you know kind of your basic standard clouds in the sky and. Uh, and that's that, you know, Jesus, he basically went up into a cloud, he's going to come back on clouds, what's the big deal, right? Um, but it is interesting that, you know, clouds typically don't move like that. Uh, but secondly, when, when God came down on Mount Sinai, it says he came down in a cloud in thick darkness. Also in Psalm 97, that he surrounds himself with a cloud and thick darkness. We see in the temple of God in heaven that he is uh, inside there was smoke and lightning and all this stuff and when he opened it that it came out like a cloud and so uh, Jesus coming back on a cloud is not just uh, for extra effect but actually the cloud is to protect his enemies it's to give them a fighting chance as it were you know that because uh, if he were just to come with all of his glory unveiled, I mean he's coming with a lot of it unveiled. But if he were to come with all of his glory unveiled, the whole earth would just begin to melt and it wouldn't there'd be nothing left. Mm -hmm. So it's like he's going to give his enemies a fighting chance, so that when he steps down on the Mount of Olives, you know they're they're actually lured into this whole thing and and they start to to continue to fight. And then he starts, you know, doing his whole thing of hacking them to bits until the blood goes up to the horse's bridle. But, you know, that's just one of those passages. It's like, oh my goodness, there's something to that cloud that is so incredible. 
you know, it, it's not just your your average cloud in the sky. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, but you know, we were talking about how Revelation is not a uh, linear book. I mean, this is like the end of the story right here in, in yes. verse seven of chapter Thank one. Thank you. Yes. You know, okay, I mean, we're in chapter one, and he's telling you about the end of the story. We, you know, he's going to come with the, in the clouds, and every eye will see him. This isn't a secret rapture. Uh, where nobody's going to see him, and your clothes are going to be all folded up nice and neat. Uh -huh. Every eye is going to see him. They also which pierce them, whoever that is. Yeah. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Oh, I mean, wow, you just you got the end of the story right at the beginning of the, <laughs> of the first yeah. chapter. Yeah, I, I, thought about, I thought about every eye seeing him. Now, obviously, when the veil between heaven and earth goes away, it, it could be that there's some dimensional properties that you know, we just have no clue about. On the other hand, I wonder if it could just be as simple as him taking a spin around the world. You know, it says that he, as the lightning goes from the east to the west, uh, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And so you know, I started thinking about that. I'm like, why? I wonder. You know, perhaps, you know, he kind of shows up. He goes, ta-da, and then he goes, you know, a few times around the planet, kind of like Superman. And he, you know, he, well, you know, he just kind of like he takes an assessment. Of the planet, and he's kind of like letting the world know I'm here, you know, and uh, you know, because it's like, okay, how is he going to see every will everybody see him? Trust me, it will not be CNN. It will not be everybody uploading their their phones to YouTube. <laughs> their iPhones. Right? I got my iPhone. I see him. <laughs> I know. I'm like, you know, when when Jesus comes back, your iPhone is dead. Your the, all <laughs> yeah. the towers are down. Everything has been destroyed. There, there's not going to be any technology to capture the moment when he Jesus says every, comes back. Every eye will see him, not every iPhone. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or eye in the sky. Okay, oh, so yeah. so he says in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. We talked about. Uh, the antithesis of that last week in Revelation 17, where it talks about the beast who says he's the one who was and is not, and yet shall be. So here's the first declaration of of the real deal, uh, the, the one who was and is and is to come. The Alpha and Omega, of course, in the Hebrew of that would be Aleph and Tav. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I guess this is kind of, you know, standard issue. He's, he's letting us know who he is, and that he's not some imposter God, but this is the Almighty God, you know, just to be sure. So it's an it's a point of authentication and, and authorization. So it's you know it's an important statement. Uh, I don't I don't see anything uh particularly uh new or, or profound that we haven't talked about yet. I mean the whole word of God is profound, but there's nothing you know that we haven't necessarily seen here. So, yeah. uh, you, I, you and I talked about this briefly when I was at your house uh, out there in California. Um, that he's the Olive Tav. That it's interesting that there just so happens to be a, an at an Olive Tav that's all. It's a direct object marker grammatically or whatever in Hebrew, uh, but it's not translated yet. It's all over your Bible. <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of like this. Here's this untranslated word all over the Hebrew Bible, and it's kind of like, I, I feel like Yeshua is saying, that's me. Yeah, I, I mean, I disagree with that. I, I think I think that's a, a very dangerous um, kind of argument to make. I The first time I heard it was by Chuck Missler, and look, you know, as having studied Hebrew, uh, you know, both spoken and modern Hebrew, I tell you, the word "at" it just—it's a direct object marker. Uh, and for those that may not be familiar with a direct object, uh, really easy: the dog chased the cat. All right, so the dog is your subject, chased is your verb, and the direct object is the cat. It's the thing that the verb or that the subject is acting upon. So in Hebrew, you'd have to put the word "at" in there: the dog chased at the cat. Right, and that's what you would do with it, and it can be used for for good situations, for bad situations, good guys, bad guys. You know, it doesn't make any difference. It's just the word that is used to mark the direct object, regardless of the action. So, if we're going to say that that's Jesus, then you suddenly have 
Jesus appearing in some pretty weird positions uh, in some uh, very evil kind of actions. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think you're going to cause yourself more trouble than good by trying to hold on to, to such a, a tradition. So, you know, I mean, I, I respect uh, Chuck Missler, but I, I radically disagree with him uh, on this point. So I don't know. I I, I don't hold it. I'll, I'm gonna let you have that one. But uh, yeah, well, I mean, I've heard his talk on it as well, and I, and I've seen it. I mean, it doesn't show up everywhere. Like with dog chase the cat, it, you would say that, that that would be a rule that the it's always gonna be there in when you see the noun and the verb and etc. But it doesn't always show up that way. And you're right; it does show up in interesting places uh, where people are doing good things and bad things. And so it kind of makes you wonder. Okay, if that theory is true then it's saying that, that Yeshua was instrumental in that person making that decision or doing whatever. But you see the same thing with it, where Yehovah is um, strength, strengthening Pharaoh's heart so Pharaoh can continue to be you know, the idiot that he was during the Exodus. Um, I, look, this is the way I look at it. Um, I am no Hebrew scholar, and, and grammar is not my thing. Uh, I find it an enormous coincidence <laughs> that the Alpha and Omega is the equivalent of the Aleph and Tav, which is an untranslated thing all over the Bible, and also that it's pronounced et. In English, we would say et. And I don't believe it's a coincidence along those same lines that the poster art for et, the extraterrestrial, was a spin on the uh, famous painting. Is it Michelangelo? I forget who painted it. Uh, where God's finger is touching the finger of Adam. Is it Michelangelo? I think it's Michelangelo. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, that it's Elliot's finger touching E.T.'s finger, and mm -hmm. it's E.T. Coincidence, maybe. Well, I, I have to respectfully disagree. I think <laughs> I think there's, there's zero connection that, um, you know, you have, uh, you know, you can't really translate the the letters Aleph and Tav as E-T. I mean, it just doesn't work. The word, the letter Aleph, you could sometimes translate that as, as as the letter A. Sometimes it can be the letter E. It could be the letter O. It could be the letter U. Right, but but you know. phonetically, if, if you said et, if, just say, if I said, Doug, how would you spell et? How would you spell it phonetically in English? E-T. Well, Sure, but I, I think you know I think that's I think that's the kind of research that's going to get you in trouble, <laughs> you know, and it's going to lose some credibility because I don't well think maybe well I mean I'm in good company with people like Dr. <laughs> Chuck Missler and others, but well but, but he, still but let's take let, let's take it to what we talked about earlier with official disclosure. Yeah. What is official disclosure all about? E. T. is our creator. E. T. is our creator. Anunnaki's are coming back and they're going to say, hey, we're the guys that uh, mixed well, I, You DNA. know, sure. I understand that. And I, I'm on board with, with the reality of what's happening there. That you have fallen angels posing as ETs, which are extraterrestrials. I get all that. But to say that there's a connection et. to the... But to, there's a connection to the Hebrew word et, I, I think it's fanciful. I, I think... I don't know. I mean, well, uh, It may be fanciful in, in our minds. But in some ways, it's mind, fanciful it's grammatically. It's fanciful grammatically. There, there's just nothing to it. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm trying to be nice about this, Rob. But I, think... I would love to see you and <laughs> Chuck Missler in a debate on this one. <laughs> well, I mean, um, you know. But actually, you know, we, I'm taking, uh, we took, I took two classes of Hebrew, so I'm nowhere in your class. I'm not even remotely close to your level of understanding of Hebrew. I just find, you know, I don't believe in coincidence. I find it's very interesting. Um, this whole why does he even come out and say that he's the Alpha and the Omega in the first place? Okay, I get it. He's the beginning and the end. Sure. Okay. okay. But why didn't he just say he's the beginning and the end? Why did he use the alphabet? Well, why not? I mean, goodness, you got to use something. Besides, they were also using the letters for numbers, right? So if you have a you know you have twenty two letters, and the Aleph is the first of those both letters and representative of numbers. And the Toph is going to be, uh, it's not the highest number because you can always keep counting, but it is the last symbol that you can use 
you know, it's like saying I'm the one and the ten. Okay, I mean, of course. Well, it actually, work be that way. one and four hundred because Tav, the the numerical value of Tav is four hundred. No, so I mean, he's, saying, I, he's saying I'm the four hundred one. No, I understand it's that. It's a four hundred one k, man. There you go. No, <laughs> I know. I mean, I totally understand that. But all I'm saying is, it. Uh, but out of the symbols that you have, okay, the symbols. Are you have Aleph to Taf, right? So of the of the given symbols that you can use to create numbers, to write numbers, that's that's really all you have. So, I mean, you know, again, I I uh, I, I consider Dr. Missler uh, a good guy, and I think uh, he's come up with a lot of great insights over the years. That is one I do not agree with him on, and if I had opportunity, I'd I'd like to gently encourage him to abandon such an idea because I think he has created a um, well he, he's influenced people like yourself and you've taken him to heart and you're believing that what he's saying is true and it's not it, it's not true at all so yeah I will say that he he put the spark of interest in me but he wasn't the one that completely influenced me because we, okay. we're as we're studying the Torah it's three years now uh, we got a friend in our group. His name is Chad. We we he does. He's really into this way more than I am. Uh, and he calls it the Et Watch. And we've found some very intriguing situations where the Et shows up and where it doesn't show up um, in Scripture. Um, but that's probably all the time we have for tonight, anyway. So maybe <laughs> we we could devote a whole show to the to the Et Watch. <laughs> Boy, I I sure hope not. I mean. Uh... You know, this word is used uh, in its various forms. It's used 6,800 times in Scripture. Um, but it just doesn't mean but Jesus. Don't you think there'd be more uses if it's just grammatical, 6,000 times? How, oh, many, and, times, uh, how oh. many times does, are there nouns and verbs where you should have this grammatical direct object marker if it's just sim simply about grammar way more than 6,000 times in, in a... Um, in a text as big as the whole Bible, wouldn't you, th wouldn't you say? Not at all. No. Really? Example, no. Well, look, the word of, this is equivalent uh, in its importance to the word of. We use the word of all the time, and you don't even think about it. It's, it's, the word of, in just the New King James Bible, appears 17,244 times. All right? So, you know, you're not going to say, well, every time the word of appears, it's talking about Jesus. I mean, that's well, he didn't call himself the of. He didn't say I am the of. I know, He's but it's the same the logic. Of. It's this is just grammar. This is where you need to let grammar be grammar, and don't start theologizing it. That's when we start getting into trouble. So, you know, well, what, wait, 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 wait. Why didn't? Why then? If we're not supposed to pay attention to grammar, why does Jesus specifically say not one jot or tittle? Well, we're talking about little little marks, accents on the letters would not pass away. Okay, well, the word et is clearly important to the text, just like the word of is important. If you take away the word of, a lot of sentences become unintelligible, right? But it doesn't mean that there's some theological value in the word of, just like there's no theological value in the word et, all standing by itself. It's just a word that, that connects other words together, right? So, uh, I mean, gee, you got lots of words in the Bible, like you got the word dog in there, you got the word donkey, but it doesn't mean that they are donkey. suddenly. We got no, talking doesn't, donkeys too. You know, well, yeah, but it doesn't mean that the word donkey is somehow a spiritual word. But in in it, as it appears in the context, uh, you know, of a talking donkey or Mary riding on a donkey. But you know, goodness, it's just a donkey. It's not like it's there's something divine about the donkey. There's nothing divine about the word of. You know, this but is. But Jesus didn't say he is a donkey or an of. <laughs> He said he's the first letter and the last letter. The but but he didn't et. say he's but he didn't say he's the word et. I mean, it, there's just there, well, there's he, no correlation. There, there's okay. no connection All whatsoever. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? That's why we're on a quest for truth, man. You know, I respect. I, know. I definitely respect your opinion. You are way ahead of me in terms of understanding Hebrew. So you know what? Fair enough. And we'll leave that to the audience to uh, do their own research. All right. See what they find out. Sounds good. Hey, it's been a pleasure. We want to thank everyone for joining us. Again, keep studying. Uh, stay on the quest. There is so much exciting stuff in Scripture. Until next time, God bless.